Hi there and welcome to PhD at Living. Today's kind of an offshoot discussion from our beer topics where we get some hard hitting science that's definitely chemistry but probably more physics. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We're talking specifically about tiers of wine and legs of whiskey. If you're unfamiliar, we're talking specifically about the process where the liquid rises in the glass against the force of gravity, forms a bead, and then falls back down under its own weight. It's the exact same process whether in wine or whiskey, or even in some high ABV beers, but it's called different names because it's poeticized by the different communities. There are two big properties that dictate how a material is going to interact like this. Surface tension and molecular interactions. They go hand in hand with each other and they're pretty tough to separate, so we're going to be bouncing back and forth between them a lot throughout the video. And with that as an introduction, let's get crazy! Let's hit the molecular interactions first. Here we have water and ethanol. They're both liquids at room temperature, and if we take out all the other components, our wine and whiskey are basically just ethanol water solutions. Cohesive interactions are among similar molecules, so we're talking water to water and ethanol to ethanol. Both water and ethanol will be quite cohesive because of their hydrogen bond capability. But Darren, what's a hydrogen bond? Well, the hydrogen bond is a very specific type of non-covalent interaction that derives from a hydrogen-oxygen-hydrogen-fluorine or hydrogen-nitrogen bond. To explain that, we kind of need to talk about polarity. And to talk about that, we got to talk about electronegativity. Oh well, let's go. Electronegativity is the property of an atom to want a single electron. So if I imagine my rectangular periodic table here, just put it in your mind, if I have something like fluorine, which is a group 7 halogen, it really wants a single electron. It wants that electron so it can get to the valence shell electron configuration of neon, which is the nearest noble gas. Noble gases are happy and stable and everybody's wonderful. So my fluorine is going to have a very high electronegativity. It wants that electron. On the other side of the periodic table, bottom left, I have something like francium. Francium, on the other hand, wants to get rid of the electron because if if it gets rid of that single electron, its valent shell electron configuration moves to the noble gas radon. Again, everybody's happy, stable, big smiles there. So francium's electronegativity is 0.7. Generally speaking, bottom left to top right, the electronegativity increases. Cool? Okay, let's move to polarity. When I take an atom and I put another atom with it, I have to subtract my electronegativities. Let's do some examples. If I have fluorine here with an electron going to another fluorine, another electron with my Lewis dot structure, I have a whole bunch of other electrons here. They are going to share this this electron. How do I know? Because you take the electronegativity difference. 4 minus 4 is, hey, wouldn't you know it, 0. So this is a very nonpolar covalent bond. Covalent meaning this electron is shared, and nonpolar meaning that it's shared equally. The 0 difference here of electronegativities means both of my fluorines have the electrons 50% of the time. Perfect sharing. Okay, and let's move up one step. Let's say I have hydrogen fluoride or hydrofluoric acid. Again, let me put my electrons here for the sake of completeness. I subtract my 4 fluorine electronegativity from my 2.1 hydrogen, which gives me to carry the 12 1.9 difference in electronegativity, which is actually fairly high. The general ranges are 0 to 0.5 is a nonpolar covalent, meaning there's fairly equal sharing here. 0.5 to about 2 difference in electronegativity means I have unequal sharing. When I say unequal sharing, it means that because the electronegativity of the fluoride is significantly higher than the electronegativity of the hydrogen, the fluorine wants the electron more, so it stays around the fluorine longer. That means I get partial negative charges because the electron sits with the fluorine more often. I get a partial, not full, negative charge on my fluorine. On the flip side, that means I have a partial positive charge on my hydrogen. Okay, now let's go real crazy. Let's say I have something like sodium, whose electronegativity is 0.9, and my fluorine again, a whole bunch of these daggone electrons. In this case, I have 4 minus 0.9. That gives me, holy cats, 3.1 difference. This isn't even a covalent bond anymore. This electron from sodium goes away entirely and moves all the way to the fluorine. This means that I have full charges now. My sodium has a positive one charge because the electron is gone. It doesn't have any piece of it. And the fluorine has a charge of negative one where the electron stays with it the whole time, okay? So we have nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, and ionic bonds. Now going back to the hydrogen bond example, I have a bond between hydrogen fluorine, hydrogen oxygen, and hydrogen nitrogen. There are two big pieces of this that make the hydrogen bond unique. The first is that I have this hydrogen bond here where I put them together. I have hydrogen and oxygen, and I have hydrogen and nitrogen. It's the electronegativity difference. Oxygen is 3.5. 
So minus 2.1 gives me 1.4. Nitrogens is three even. I'm gonna subtract that from 2.1, okay, 0 0.9. These are generally very polar covalent bonds. The other piece of it is there's at least one electron lone pair in each of these. This comes into play because of the actual hydrogen bond. Remember that none of these covalent bonds is a hydrogen bond. It comes with the second molecule. So let's just say, for instance, I have a hydrogen here and an oxygen here with another hydrogen. Hey, wouldn't you know it? It's water. Again, we have all sorts of this polarity happening. So we have delta negatives and delta positives on all this stuff. So I'm going to end up having my delta positives and delta negatives of my oxygens and my hydrogens start to coordinate with stuff. My highly delta negative, partial negative oxygen, fluorine, and nitrogen really want to coordinate with the delta positive hydrogens in my water because of the hydrogen bond. It's kind of like this dot, dot, dot thing going on here. Wee, look at me. I'm bonding with everything. Oh, it's so fun. On the flip side, my delta negative oxygen is going to want to coordinate over here with these delta positive hydrogens. All right. So that's the hydrogen bond. That's polarity. That's electronegativity. Can I please stop now? Keep all this in mind for just a little bit of time. I promise we'll get there and it'll make sense. What all of that means is that because water has two OH bonds, even though they share the same oxygen, and ethanol only has one OH bond, water is doubly capable of creating those hydrogen bonds between its molecules. What that means is that the intermolecular interactions between water molecules are higher and stronger than intermolecular interactions between ethanol molecules. Meaning, 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 the cohesive forces between water molecules are higher than they are from ethanol molecules. Okay, adhesive interactions happen between different molecules. So we're looking at water ethanol interactions instead of water water ethanol ethanol interactions. In addition, with our booze in the glass example, we see the water and the ethanol molecules and how they interact with the glass of the glass itself and the molecules of the air swirling around inside the glass. Let's break each one of those down. Our tumbler glass is composed predominantly of silicon dioxide, SiO2. You might also hear me say this as silica, no, I'm not mispronouncing anything. Because of formal charge arguments and that silicon sits directly underneath carbon in the periodic table, you might think the SiO2 structure looks like this, kind of like carbon dioxide. The silicon is double bonded to each of the two oxygens. However, that's not how it works. Because of a crazy covalent network in the silicon dioxide, each one of the silicon atoms ends up being bonded to four different oxygen atoms. Uh, wait a minute here. Wouldn't that mean the empirical formula is supposed to be SiO4? It turns out that answer lies in the crazy covalent network. If I ignore all geometry and space considerations, I can make a network that looks something kind of like this. Here you can see each one of my two silicon atoms is bonded singly to four different oxygens, and each one of the four oxygens is bonded singly to two different silicon atoms. If I add all this up, I have two silicon atoms, four oxygens, Si2O4, which when we use our powers of division, we end up getting the empirical formula SiO2. The actual network is similar to this and carries the same stoichiometry, although it's significantly bigger and doesn't have all this weird steric stuff in here. Now let's look at the electronegativity difference to see if these bonds are polar. Oxygens is 3.5 and silicons is 1.8, meaning our difference is 1.7, well in favor of the oxygen. That means that each one of these silicon oxygen single bonds is going to be very highly polar, with the delta negative being on oxygen and each of the delta positives being on the silicon atoms. Uh, but I thought silica was nonpolar. Yes, okay, fine. The molecule itself is nonpolar because the planes of symmetry cancel the dipoles, but the bonds themselves are polar. I'm trying to make a video about whiskey. Why are you doing this? <sighs> Here we can see an idealized form of the interactions between the silicon dioxide and the glass and the water and the whiskey. The partial negative on the oxygen and the silicon dioxide and the glass coordinates with the partial positive of the hydrogen and the water and the partial positive of the silicon and the silicon dioxide and the glass coordinates with the partial negative of the oxygen and the water. Looking at our electronegativity differences, we know the difference between silicon and oxygen is 1.7 and the difference between oxygen and hydrogen is 1.4. This is why the partial positive of the hydrogen and the water would rather coordinate adhesively with the partial negative oxygen and the silicon dioxide and the glass than it would cohesively interact with a partial negative of an oxygen in a different water molecule. Sound good? Air, on the other hand, is a gaseous mixture of a bunch of different stuff, like nitrogen gas, oxygen gas, carbon monoxide, and dioxide, and a little splashes of argon just I threw in there for fun. A majority of these are very nonpolar covalent, meaning they don't really have any reason to react with our polar ethanol or very polar water. God, that was so much easier than the last one. Next, let's hit surface tension. Surface tension is the ability for a liquid to make the least surface area possible. For instance, if we have a flat surface and put a droplet of water on it, the water will make a half sphere. 
After all, the sphere is the shape that has the lowest surface area to volume ratio. This is also an example of cohesive forces, where those water molecules inside the droplet would probably rather interact with each other than they would adhesively pool on the surface of whatever they're touching. Finally, because water has more cohesive forces than ethanol, water has a higher surface tension. And now a quick word from our sponsor. This video brought to you by PhD in Living Whiskey. Who cares if it's 9 a.m.? Tell your boss that great science never discovered itself. Let's touch on volatility. Volatility in this context has nothing to do with explosions, and in fact is more the ability of a material to evaporate. The parameter we're using here is vapor pressure, and vapor pressure is the pressure exerted by a gas in equilibrium with its condensed phases, either solid or liquid. Much easier to explain by way of example. If I have a sealed container in which I put some water, a certain amount of that liquid water will go into the gaseous phase, will evaporate, and will fill that headspace. It will eventually reach an equilibrium pressure, and that is the vapor pressure of our water. Let's compare that with ethanol. Because more molecules of the ethanol will find their way into the headspace of the material, ethanol has a higher vapor pressure. More vapor pressure means more volatility. That means that in a given environment, if we have an ethanol water mixture like, oh gee, I don't know, wine, the ethanol in that solution is more likely to evaporate and will evaporate more quickly than the water will. Cool? Okay, let's recap and look at our three different properties here. Because the cohesive properties of water are higher than that of ethanol, water will want to make the least surface area possible more than ethanol, meaning it has a higher surface tension. All that cohesion aside, the polarity of those hydrogen bonds also make it better for it to interact with the highly polar silicon dioxide bonds in the material of our glass. This means that adhesively the water would rather react with the glass than the ethanol would. Finally, because ethanol has a higher vapor pressure, its volatility is higher. So in our wine or whiskey environment, the water wants to make the least amount of surface area possible and is going to preferentially interact with our glass material, while the ethanol is probably going to evaporate more quickly. Now let's put all this together and explain the legs of whiskey. Oh, hop off, it's iced tea. Who am I, Martin Sheen in Apocalypse Now? <laughs> Come on. Okay, now comes the good stuff. We've got our water and our ethanol intimately mixed because they're miscible liquids, and that solution is sitting inside our silicon dioxide glass. Remember that our air molecules don't really interact all that much, so for the purposes of this demonstration, we're just gonna ignore them. The first thing that happens here is capillary forces start to draw this liquid solution up the sides of the glass. This is because the adhesive forces of the ethanol in the water with the silicon dioxide of the glass wall are higher than the forces cohesively between the molecules themselves. Because the water has higher cohesive forces and higher surface tension, it wants to climb the glass higher. It also has higher adhesive forces to the side of the glass. Concurrent to all this, some of the ethanol starts to evaporate because it has higher vapor pressure. What happens now is we have a concentration gradient and a surface tension gradient in our solution. At the bottom right where the liquid meets the glass, we have a much higher concentration of ethanol, and near the top where the drop starts to form, we have a much higher concentration of water. The higher aqueous concentration, because the cohesive forces of the water, the surface tension, and the adhesive forces of the glass, cause more and more water to be drawn up the sides of the glass, eventually creating that droplet. Eventually, the downward force of gravity is greater than the upward force from the adhesive, cohesive, surface tension, everything else, of the water, and the droplet falls back down into the glass. And that, my friends, is the basic principle on tiers of wine and legs of a whiskey. The higher the alcohol concentration, the easier it is for all this stuff to happen. The reason is because that surface tension and concentration gradient is much greater when the concentration of ethanol is higher down here, meaning the concentration of water is lower, and the surface tension of the water allows it up here, very highly concentrated, to pull more and more of the water up because, again, that surface tension gradient is so much greater when there's more ethanol down here. This whole process, first observed by James Thompson, brother of Lord Kelvin, he of the Kelvin temperature scale, was described by Carlo Marangoni in his doctoral dissertation in 1865 and explained fully by J. Willard Gibbs in 1875. The flow of liquids because of a surface tension gradient, that is, liquids move because there's a different amount of surface tension from one end to the other, is now known as the Gibbs-Marangoni effect. And there you have it, folks. The flow of liquids because of a surface tension gradient. And that is what gives us our tears of wine and legs of whiskey. Gosh, I love when science works, huh? Slangsha. 
A census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti.